thank you for all of the folks who are sticking with us through this rapid pace and many topics. We're moving on now to a really exciting topic, looking at retrofitting biomass energy plants to produce biochar. This can be a cost-effective and rapid way to increase production capacity of high-quality biochar. Our moderator for this panel will be Annie Nichols, of, who is the U.S. Carbon Removal Sourcing Manager at Carbon Future, a long-standing IBI sustaining member and symposium sponsor. Hi, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining the session today titled Retrofitting Bioenergy Plants for Biochar Production. My name is Annie Nichols, and I serve as the U.S. Carbon Removal Sourcing Manager for Carbon Future, an end-to-end -end platform helping biochar producers access high-quality carbon removal credits. I'm honored to be moderating this panel today with two biochar superstars with over 32 years of combined experience in the biochar industry. After each presentation, um, or actually, um, we will have a Q&A uh, session at the end. So please do put your questions in the Q&A submission form um, to the right. Um, the first person we will hear from today is Tom Miles, who's the president of TR Miles Technical Consultants out of Portland, Oregon. His firm designs, develops, installs, and commissions systems for processing wood, agricultural, and urban residues ash transformations, and the production of biochar for recycling nutrients in soil. He has sponsored and hosted online discussions of biomass energy since 1994 and biochar since 2006. He is the past chairman of the International Biochar Initiative and is the current executive director of the U.S. Biochar Initiative. After Tom, we will hear from Josiah Hunt. Josiah is the, co is the founder and CEO of Pacific Biochar, a public benefit corporation that modifies biomass power plants for biochar production. Josiah graduated from the University of Hawaii at Hilo in 2004 with a Bachelor of Science in Agroecology and Environmental Quality. Since 2008, he has helped to innovate methods for biochar production, processing, and application in farming systems. Pacific Biochar was also the first U.S.-based company to certify and sell biochar-based carbon removal credits all the way back in November 2020. So he's really set the stage for us. I will now hand it over to Tom to kick us off and give us an overview on the scope of the bioenergy industry and opportunities for adding pyrolyzers to existing boilers. So thank you, Annie. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? So as Annie described, uh, I've spent much of my career with biomass energy and biomass energy plants. And uh, uh, the last, uh, uh, since about 2004, I've been interested in, in biochar and different, not only systems for application for generation of the biochar, but also uh, systems to apply it. Next slide, please. So why are we interested in biomass plants for retrofitting to, to biochar? And, and part of the reason is in the United States, for example, according to our U.S. Department of Energy, we have a, a, a billion tons of sustainable biomass available that could be converted to energy, biochar, or the co-products. Uh, so we have a gigaton of biomass and about half of that. Uh, previous slide, please. So we have a gigaton of biomass, and, a, and about half of that is, uh, is carbon. So if we convert uh, the carbon, half of the carbon, into biochar, sequester in the soil, we can sequester about 625 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is equivalent to about 44 million automobiles, about 15% of the automobile population in the U.S., or about 247 million acres of forest. So that presents to us quite an interesting opportunity. The biomass industry itself actually only consumes about point, that's okay, next slide please, about 0.13 gigatons or about 130 million tons of, uh, of biomass. There are about 159 biomass plants in the or biomass to power plants in the United States. Of those 90 uh, convert uh, biomass and another 66 convert municipal waste. So of the biomass plants, there are six that convert ag waste and 90 that convert wood waste. You can see from the map here, the plants that are where the locations of the biomass energy plants are. Biomass plants generate about 45% of the renewable energy generated in the United States. 
the difference in the symbols here is simply that the ones in blue are members of the Biomass Power Association. Next slide, please. So of the 40 million tons that the, uh, that the wood plants and so on generate uh, or, or, or use actually dry tons, uh, I thought I'd show an example of a biomass plant, a uh, biomass energy plant, so you can see the context of, of what a retrofit might be. And in this case, this is simply a slide of one of the plants, a 30 megawatt plant and its fuel supply. Uh, in this case, the fuel comes mostly from uh, residues from the wood processing industries, but also forest residues. Next slide. With forest residues, uh, here's an example of this particular plant has field crews that go out and they grind slash or forest residues and put them into trucks like this possum belly, as we call it. Uh, this truck will haul about 15 dry tons of, um, of biomass per load which would be converted if we were converting it in a typical process to about three tons of biochar. Uh, a similar truck would haul about 10 to 15 tons of finished biochar product. Uh, unfortunately, in our context in the United States, harvesting forest residues uh, is expensive. Uh, and as you've seen, I think in uh, previous presentations, there are some mobile devices that would produce biochar in the field directly in place of this grinder. Next, next slide, please. So the truckloads, you can see an example of the, uh, the, the mixed fuel. Uh, the truckloads are, are, are tipped uh, in this truck tipper into the fuel pile, managed, conditioned in the fuel pile, and fed to the power plant. Next slide. This particular power plant is a 30 megawatt plant, uh, consumes roughly about 30 to 35 dry tons per hour of energy, producing about 10 cubic yards of biochar per hour, about a ton per hour. Uh, next slide. And here's the turbine. Uh, as it says here, it takes about 1.1 bone dry tons of clean wood to generate one megawatt hour of electricity. Uh, this particular plant, uh, 30 megawatt plant, uh, probably serves and generates enough electricity for about 25, 25 26,000 ohms. Next slide. And here's the co-product it makes, uh, char that is removed from the gases that exit the, uh, the boiler and uh, makes perfectly good char. And this company has been in, in business for uh, a few years now, delivering to a variety of applications. Next slide. So here's how it works, uh, recovering char from the boiler. Uh, in this schematically, this is a boiler the very similar to one of the power plants on the left-hand side, but the biomass is burned in a furnace and out of the hot furnace, uh, as you feed fine wood particles in, some of the particles don't completely burn out in the furnace and they wind up being carried by the combustion gases following the arrows through the what we call the convection sections where the hot gas is converted to steam um, and the gas then uh, uh, once it exits the boiler goes through and, and preheats air that is used in combustion and then it goes through a separator that we call a cyclone or multiclone and that multiclone will take particles that are down to about 10 microns in size uh, and these particular particles in this first cut are relatively rich in carbon, from 60 to 80% carbon. And so this is the char that we can remove from existing power plants. Now, typically this char is, is sent back to the boiler to be reburned, um, so that the operator can make a choice as to whether to separate this char and, and sell it as biochar or uh, reburn it and generate uh, electricity by converting that carbon uh, to steam and going through the steam turbine. Uh, but there are there are investments involved in doing this, and so uh, it's a uh, uh, a decision as to whether to recover this char or not. And Josiah, who will speak next, will show us examples of how that is done. The gas then, once most of the carbon is removed, continues to what's called the electrostatic precipitator that takes the uh, mineral components of the ash. That's the gray ash that you see uh, from a from a power plant. So next slide, please. Typically, we can we can recover somewhere between one and two percent of the dry biomass that goes into a boiler can be recovered as char. Uh, this is just simply pictures example of the char. 
uh, packaged in a two cubic yard bag that has about 500 dry pounds of material in it, or uh, hauled bulk anywhere from 10 to 100 cubic yard uh, truckloads that may, may contain between 10 and 14 dry tons, or the equivalent of about 20 to 25 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Next slide. So here's an example of a 50 megawatt plant. This is a, uh, one of the larger plants that we have in the United States, one of my clients. They consume about 400,000 dry tons of, uh, of uh, or tons per year of biomass. Pictured here, you can see the fuel pile, which is 36,000 tons of, of fuel. It's conditioned for a month. The truck dumpers uh, are up at the top and they're delivering about t uh, 12 trucks per hour each dumper will dump about six trucks per hour. A bulldozer then takes that biomass material at once it's conditioned, uh, pushes it to what's called a reclaim, a conveyor that will take it through uh, screening, sizing uh, to the appropriate size specifications for the boiler. And then it's conveyed over to the buildings on the left, which contain the equipment I show you, showed you before. So this particular plant is generating enough power for about 35, about uh, 35,000 homes. And it would, if it were a biochar plant, just producing biochar and power uh, would probably produce about eight or 9,000 tons of biochar per year. Next slide. So here's what's involved in it. Oh, back one. Here's what's involved in, in uh, adding to a uh, retrofitting an existing biomass plant. If we want to put in a separate line, to recover more than 2% uh, as biochar, but actually make biochar and then use the byproduct heat to generate power. It's a busy slide, but on the left-hand side, you can see the, uh, uh, the fuel coming in. If we wanted to take that 50 megawatt plant and add 12 megawatts to it, we would add an additional 120,000 dry tons per year. Uh, we would make about 20,000 tons of biochar per year, or about eight truckloads of biochar per day. So bringing the fuel in, we're adding about 20% to the fuel handling, but we can make use of the existing infrastructure, the existing fuel handling uh, equipment at the plant, but then we'll have to dry it. And most carbonizers require uh, fuel that's 15% moisture less, so we would have to add a dryer. We also may have to add additional sizing, either on the dry side or the wet side, because most of the pyrolysis systems uh, want a feedstock that is smaller than we would, what we would ordinarily put in a biomass plant. So we dry the fuel, uh, dry the feedstock. We go into a pyrolyzer, which would be also be new equipment. We can take the some of the gas off the pyrolyzer and use it to fire the dryer or send it down to a pellet mill or other dry wood processing facility. And then we could take the hot gas and put it into a boiler. We can recover energy, 12 megawatts in this case, or we can send steam over to a dry kiln in a, in a wood plant. And on the biochar side, we have to build in the capacity to cool and quench the biochar, uh, to granulate it if that's what we need to do, to package it, uh, otherwise package it, or to pelletize it and to ship it to the specifications. We need to add the post-processing to meet the specifications of uh, the markets. So you can see examples of the markets off to the right in agriculture, uh, building uh, products, environment, forestry, all have different uh, applications which require in some cases different specifications. So what we're doing to retrofit an existing plant with a high level of production is adding a whole new processing line, uh, which is similar to the existing biomass plant. But what we're sharing is uh, the infrastructure that brings the feedstock into the plant. Uh, and, uh, and also we have the opportunity to uh, add heat and uh, provide an incremental uh, capacity boost to an existing plant. Next, next slide, please. This is just an illustration of uh, the different conversion technologies that we could add to retrofit to uh, an existing plant. Uh, the baseline would be the boiler, which produces about 95% of the energy in the biomass to steam. About 2%, 1 to 2% will come out as biochar in the manner that I described. We can use a gasifier, which will yield about 5 to 18% biochar, uh, and the rest will go into energy. Um, and Or we can add a pyrolyzer. On the right-hand side, you can see a picture of what goes on in a boiler. This is one of my clients. 
Uh, you can see the fuel falling down, uh, the speckles of fuel falling down onto the grate. And you can imagine that the uh, energy of that buoyant gas rising up will carry some of the fine particles out, which can be recovered as biochar. Next slide. Here's an example of, a, of an existing retrofit plant. Uh, this is actually not a retrofit plant. It was built new. It's a green ethanol plant that's generating uh, ethanol fuel uh, for the uh, transport market. And they wanted to lower the carbon intensity of the plant. And so they put in a gasifier. Uh, and in the gasifier will handle, uh, well, the, the, uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the fuel house. They actually bringing in dry fuel, so they don't need to add a dryer. The dry fuel is sized and conveyed to the gasifiers, which are the two horizontal gray tubes in the bottom. The gas comes off, and in the, that vertical uh, gray tube is called a thermal oxidizer. It's burning the off gas from the gasifier. Uh, the off gas then goes into the boiler where the red piping is, uh, and then that goes into a turbine, seven megawatt turbine, generating all the steam and power for the for the fuel plant and at the same time generating about 15,000 tons of biochar per year. And you can see the blue conveyor uh, in the picture off to the left, and it's conveying to a loadout bin that will load the biochar, uh, send the biochar off to other uses off site. To the right-hand side, you can see the biochar humic DG char X product. That's a biochar based uh, with humates uh, sold by the company that owns this facility. Uh, next slide. Just to give you an idea of what that gasifier looks like, uh, and this just is one of many reactors that could be used, uh, but the biomass comes in, goes into a horizontal auger, and as the auger conveys the material uh, horizontally, a little bit of air is, is added to the process, uh, generating enough heat to convert the solid to a gas. The gas then goes off into the boiler and the char is extracted. Next slide. Here's another example of a pyrolysis equipment that could be added. This is a rotary kiln. This happens to be in China. Uh, generates, uh, produces about 4,000 dry tons of biochar per year. So there would be a couple of these in a plant where we, we might add uh, or uh, generate, uh, say, 12 megawatts of power. Next slide. Here's an example of other reactors. These happen to be used, uh, they're pictured in, in uh, biosolids plants, uh, but it's the same components. On the left-hand side, you have the dryer. Uh, previous slide. Maybe advancing automatically or something. Previous, yeah, there you go. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have the feedstock dryer, uh, and then the, the dry material goes over to the darker green machine, which in this case is the pyrolyzer. And in the right-hand side, uh, uh, there are con uh, also continuous processes, uh, BOW, Pyreg, Echo Remedy. We have a number of companies and a number of options now for converting the uh, material to biochar at the industrial scale. And this is just a, oh, that's okay. Next slide. So this is just a selection of industrial scale systems that could go in alongside existing power plants. On the left-hand side, you have the one I've described at the grain ethanol plant. Uh, the, the next one is uh, restoration fuels. It's torrefaction and biochar process, uh, as well as Airx. They produce a biochar product. Uh, Frontline uh, Bioenergy has a unique uh, autothermal pyrolysis. Um, system that produces a variety of products, chart technologies, and the far right is a rotary kiln like the one I showed from China. So we have a number of a number of uh, potential processes that uh, can be used for retrofit, and I will pass it along to Josiah, who will describe uh, how he recovers biochar from biomass plants in practice. Tom. Always amazing. Um, the amount of knowledge and wisdom that, uh, that you can share on the biomass industry and its integration with the biochar industry is always impressive and endless, it seems. Um, so uh, Josiah Hunt here. Um, thanks again, Tom. You can make my job easy here with this presentation. I guess we can go ahead and start with the first slide. Okay. Um, 
So Pacific biochar um, to sequester carbon and leave a legacy of fertile soil. That's that's our company mission. Next slide. Uh, we've been doing this since 2016. Um, this is a pile of biochar um, produced at a biomass power plant that was modified for biochar production and delivered to a vineyard uh, here in the winter of 2016, uh, early winter of 2016. Next slide. Um, so this is one of the biomass power plants that we've modified for biochar production. Um, and at this facility, you know, as Tom was describing, there's the carbon that leaves the boiler furnace area and can be recaptured and re-injected back into the boiler to be used as fuel. And what we're doing is basically creating an alternative pathway to harvest that carbon as biochar instead of re-injecting it as fuel. And when that's done, you have two choices. One, you keep the feedstock input the same and you see a reduced energy output. Every ton of biochar is a ton of carbon that could have been burned for energy. So if we're harvesting that carbon, we're going to see an energy output drop. Or you increase the amount of fuel input to maintain the same electrical output. And in all situations that we've worked with, maintaining the, uh, maintaining the electrical output is, is critical um, and valuable. And so the pathway chosen is to increase the fuel input. Uh, this is particularly valuable in California and much of the Western U.S., where there is a glut of biomass, uh, particularly forest biomass, in managing, mitigating, and, and cleaning up after some of the um, catastrophic wildfires in the area. So this increased throughput of biomass um, is a benefit as well. Next slide, please. Uh, after the biochar is produced, it's pretty simple. We can just load this in standard trucks. This is a uh, a live bottom belted trailer here, shipping on regular roads, doesn't need anything fancy in this area. Next slide. A lot of our biochar lands at compost yards before going out to the field. We are co-located, or some of our primary processing facilities are co-located at compost yards using shared equipment. Um, and there are also many synergies uh, with biochar and compost uh, for the end use. Next slide. Ultimately, most all of our biochar is going out to the fields. Um, this is a vineyard that we've been working with for about seven years now. And we have six years, uh, greater than six years now, actually, of, of field trials, um, robust field trials showing that biochar has been able to provide them with um, a significant return on their biochar investment. Um, and, and this kind of groundwork, pun intended, um, really helps make it possible to deploy large amounts of biochar because working in deploying all this biochar yes we have a lot of research articles that can show that it can have positive effect but you still need to have you still need to have the approval and the, the, the buy-in from the farming community or wherever this biochar plans on going and and sometimes that's has to be earned through trust and through through working together so uh, it, it's critical here working with some of these vineyards uh, and, and other agricultural organizations in the area um, and having worked with them for years to help gain these deployment pathways for biochar. Next slide, please. This is the equation. This is it. This is what, this is what we've reduced it down to, basically, to figure out uh, the, the viability of a project or not. So when the carbon is worth more in the ground than it is in the furnace, uh, a viable business we might have, you know, that, that, that means that there might be something there. And so that's the critical part. If we are looking at a new facility, this would be part of the feasibility assessment. Can we make that true? Can we make the carbon worth more in the ground than it is in the furnace? And if we can answer that, yes, and at scale, then a viable project we might have. And as Tom explained earlier in the slides, um, how that would technically and mechanically work. Next slide, please. For, gosh, I've been doing this since 20 to 2009 and, um, and with biomass power plants uh, solidly since about 2015. Um, 
until 2020, until the very tail end of 2020, we had to do that on ag sales alone, um, which we survived, but barely. It was a meager uh, existence uh, at that, where the, the entire value, we had to make that equation true. We had to make the carbon worth more in the ground than it is in the furnace based purely on the willingness of farmers and others in the agriculture and horticultural in industries to purchase biochar. Um, and we survived, but meagerly. Next slide, please. Now the game has changed. Now the carbon removal benefits of biochar have not only been noticed, but there are now robust systems to actually provide financial reward for carbon dioxide removed utilizing the biochar pathway. And so with that support, now we've got two legs to stand on. Now with the biochar production and application, we can have a carbon removal credit to give us some sort of baseline support as well as ag sales. And those two working together can hopefully get us to a viable project. Now I will note, this is a really interesting relationship because you can't get that carbon removal credit until the biochar has been safely sequestered. So the two are tied in a really interesting way because you might be under the gun to supply your for your carbon removal credits without having sufficient sales demand lined up already, uh, which creates a really interesting um, uh, interplay between how to manage these two values of the potential material. Um, but it's great that we have that opportunity. Next slide, please. So this is something that I, I find really interesting. I think with a lot of the biomass power infrastructure that we have right now, I think about this a lot. Um, we're now on the fringe of where biochar can be a viable ancillary product. So I would say, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but we're, we're just on the far left side here, beginning on this trajectory, where I think for, for many facilities, um, biochar can be now a viable ancillary product, right? The carbon markets are still young and developing. Um, the biochar deployment, you know, the biochar sales are volatile, but growing. Um, and so we're now into that fringe area where biochar is a viable ancillary product at a fair number of facilities. And as this price of carbon, and I just kind of blankly use the price of carbon, not just carbon removal credits, but also the carbon as biochar. As this price of carbon gains in solidity, you know, you know how solid and how um, dependable that price is, and also how high that price is, whether by carbon, carbon removal alone or by sales, as that continues to increase, um, biochar becomes solidly uh, a solid ancillary product. And then at some point, we could be looking at energy as the ancillary product. Now, another element of this is the is the is the price of energy, right? So, if the price of energy is coming down, or you know, wind and solar, other projects are able to deliver energy at a lower price, then that could raise the relative price of carbon. But we could easily be looking at a lot of the biomass infrastructure transitioning into biochar as an ancillary product, and then potentially even all the way over the scale where energy becomes the ancillary product. All right, now some, with some of the early stage modifications that we're doing right now. It's, we're just looking at biochar as an ancillary, but I think Tom Miles identified really well some of the add-ons, some of the auxiliary kilns that could be included um, to augment some of the infrastructure where energy becomes the ancillary product. And I, I'm, I think that's a really interesting thing to note. Uh, next slide, please. Here's some of the projects that we're working on right now. Um, this is one of our pioneer facilities. Uh, this is at Humboldt Sawmill. We're generating biochar from woody biomass um, at scale. And uh, this was the facility where we registered the first carbon credits in North America. Um, and we're currently producing biochar uh, at a pretty fast clip there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are now two plants in Georgia, two, uh, two sister plants that we're going to be bringing online with biochar production. Um, and that is any day now. Um, we've been working on that for a while. Next slide, please. Uh, another plant here in California, Honey Lake Power. Uh, we're, we're slated to, uh, to get started on that in early 23. Uh, so early next year, we're going to get going on that. Um, this is our engineer, Jim Turner, here um, while we're doing a feasibility assessment at the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, there are several more in the Western U.S. that we are looking to bring online as well. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is this is how we work with biomass power plants. So Pacific Biochar, we help make possible what Tom Miles was explaining. So that could be how those are some of the technical and mechanical means of of achieving biochar production. But then there's a lot more to it. You know, how do you how do you do this profitably? Um, and logistics, permits, there's a lot to manage there. So that's the role of Pacific Biochar is to, to be able to make this happen and make it easy as a manufacturing partner. So what we'd start with is first a feasibility assessment. If it looks like we've got, if it looks like there's, it, it, that it's feasible, then we work to arrange a profitable agreement for the biochar production and offtake. Profitable to the, to the, bio, to the biomass energy plant, that is. Um, then we design the necessary facility upgrades plus build and finance those upgrades. Um, then we work to make sure that we get the logistics of the biochar from site to soil, as well as all associated permits. Pacific Biochar will handle all of that. The biochar deployment, whether loss or gain. And that's, that's going back to what I was talking about earlier. You have this funny interplay between the carbon removal credits and the biochar sales where the carbon removal credits, they want to see massive scaling and they want to see fast and they got to have their quarterly commitments, but the biochar sales are spotty and seasonal um, where we might have seasons where it's really hard to move material because maybe just because of weather. Um, and then other times you have crop failures within the region that really tighten the belt of local organizations, you know, local farming organizations that would normally buy it. And now they're in a really hard position where they might not have that cash on hand to be making that kind of investment. So the biochar deployment, whether loss or gain, that's for us to figure out. And we will guarantee a profitable agreement and a, and a, and a guaranteed offtake for all these materials. The carbon credit registration and optimization. So not just getting the facility and the biochar registered, but optimizing that process to get the best value as well as the, uh, the daily accounting and reporting that goes on with that. Every truck, the weights, all the details of that. Carbon credit sales and related contracts. Um, we can be the face of and negotiate the carbon credit sales and all those related contracts, um, as well as providing a liability um, safety wall for all that. And then serving as a point of contact and public relations for all biochar deployment and carbon credit exposure. So. There's a lot going on in like if you if a facility wants to begin producing biochar, all the permits, regulations, sales, logistics, and all of that. And while some organizations might be um, ready to take that on themselves, others might not be excited about doing that. And that's where Pacific Biochar comes in. We can make all this possible. We can help make the whole thing possible. So in short, we make the carbon worth more in the ground than it is in the furnace, and we make it easy for you. Um, so that's how, that's how one, one example of a service, a uh, manufacturing partner service that can be offered in space. Uh, next slide, please. We do this with, uh, a relatively small team, uh, at the moment, myself, the CEO, uh, young and ambitious, uh, Charlie McIntosh, the products manager, helps make everything move, makes it move on time. Um, Michael Fallon, attorney at law, handles our legal and finance. Uh, and then Jim Turner with 35 years experience in the biomass power industry as our lead engineer, um, helping make sure that all needs are met and, and uh, your manufacturing installations go smooth. And that's about it. Uh, I can help answer any questions later. Um, next slide. Yep, that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Josiah and Tom, for those very interesting presentations. Um, we have a lot of questions and we're running a bit late, so I'm just going to do two. But I wanted to note that if you go over to the Q&A section, um, Tom Miles has been answering a lot of these questions. Um, so you can check out some of those answers there. And then Tom and Josiah will also be in the lounge um, in the room associated with this session. So you can talk to them privately or in a group session after this and ask more of these questions. Um, but the first one I wanted to ask um, was, what is the quality of the char coming out of these uh, plants? And does it, you know, what are the characteristics, quality, and could it pass a certification like the European biochar certificate? 
And I might hand it to Josiah first. I know this is mm -hmm. something we talk about all the time, um, <laughs> <laughs> like every week. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over there. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. It is, uh, yes, it can, and no, it does not uh, are both true, uh, are, are, would both be accurate answers. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it, it, it depends, I guess. So that, that, that's something that it, it, it can definitely be some of the clean, it's some of the cleanest char I've seen, actually. It's, it can definitely be a very high quality product, but it's not necessarily a given that it will be such a high product. There has to be some uh, quality control and management, active management to ensure the quality. I guess the way I'd answer that uh, is that both is I'd echo the yes and no and the and the no depends on the feedstock that's being used and the design of the particular facility, the boiler, and the way it's operated. Uh, and so we see uh, some of the chars uh, that have higher ash contents uh, and so require a certain amount of post-processing. So the quality can vary. I think one of the, the, the assumptions a lot of people make is that this is going to be pretty tarry, junky stuff. And in most cases, it's pretty clean from the tar point of view. Uh, uh, because it's become slightly oxidized. So we do have plants, uh, as Josiah has shown, that make good quality good quality material, and people like Josiah are necessary for ensuring the, the biochar quality. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shove two questions in one here, um, and that is how many of these plants currently exist that have been retrofitted, um, bioenergy plants that have been retrofitted to um, to produce biochar, and what is typically the cost of that um, to, to do that retrofitting? Maybe I'll shoot it over to Tom first, and then we'll go to Josiah. Yeah, in terms of of uh, plants that have been that are recovering char from the flue gas, mm -hmm. um, there are several plants uh, that that have been uh, retrofit, but you know, less than twenty probably nationwide. Uh, we see them in a couple of areas. We see them in the out here in the west, where we have more biomass facilities, and we see uh, char recovered from wood processing facilities from industry and so on, as well as power plants in the southeast, where you have a high concentration of wood processing. There's almost nothing being recovered right now in the northeast of the United States, um, and and that's that's an area where, there, where there's a a lot of opportunity because there's a there's a good market. Um, the, uh, there, there are no plants that we know of that are uh, that have put in um, parallel processing facilities like the ones I showed, except that I know there are three or four projects that are in the works. And, and we're talking in the uh, more than tens and closer to $100 million uh, for retrofitting for, say, 20,000 tons of biochar per year. So they can be pretty expensive. Uh, we we think there's opportunity for a lot a number of smaller facilities that might be in the five or ten million dollar range, uh, but one of the challenges we have is actually the expectations of management. Uh, people in the power business are interested in power and money. Uh, they don't really know anything about biochar, so convincing them that they should make even a marginal investment to recover the biochar uh, is something of a challenge. And obviously, Josiah has been successful at. <laughs> but I know it's taken a lot of no. Lot of that's a, a lot of hours to do it. That's a that's a really good point, Tom. I mean, the the, the technical uh, the technical parts of it are the easiest. Um, it's it's really there's a lot to to do to convince because it's. I mean, operating one of these biomass power plants, it's like I don't know I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, it's like driving a spaceship. I mean, it, there's <laughs> so many like the control boards are immense, and and you've got like these electrical panels that it's, it's like this scary zone. Like, don't touch anything. And uh, yeah, it's 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 really, I think, stressful and um, and critical to even operate one of these things and to consider complicating the process with some little biochar thing. It's like, what is this fairy dust? You know, so it's it 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 is. I mean, just getting the buy-in is uh, what we found to be one of the most difficult um, parts of the process and the technical um, actual upgrades that the, the the actual upgrades that we have to install are fairly simple it's fairly straightforward perfect 
Well, thank you both so much. Um, I definitely learned something from both of you, um, as I always do, and I really appreciate your time today. And thanks to everyone for attending. Just one more reminder, if you head over to the lounge, um, Josiah and Tom will be hanging out in those rooms um, so that you can ask more of these questions, and please do. Um, and so thank you so much. I'll see you soon.